Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Anne, and I work with the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group. The ICLMG is a coalition of 45 Canadian civil society organizations that came together after the rushed adoption of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2001 to monitor the impact of national security and the war on terror on civil liberties. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on unceded, unsurrendered Algonquin territory, also known as Ottawa, Canada, and that the stolen land must be returned to the jurisdiction and care of the Algonquin people. This event is co-hosted by ICLMG, Queen's University, and the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa. As the title indicates, the Extradition Act has been described as the least fair law in Canada by leading experts. In this webinar, we will hear details on why Canada's extradition system is broken and how it can be reformed using a new blueprint known as the Halifax Proposals. Let me introduce today's speakers and what they will be talking about for about seven to 10 minutes each. Then we will have a Q&A and final comments from our panelists. Feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box as soon as they come to you. The webinar is um, being recorded and so it will be able, you'll be able to watch or rewatch it later on. Uh, we were hoping to live stream it to Facebook, but it's, it's um, not happening, unfortunately. Um, our first speaker uh, will be John Packer. John is the inaugural Nürburger Jessen Professor of International Conflict Resolution in the Faculty of Law and Director of the Human Rights Research and Education Center at University of Ottawa. Through his 30 year career, including 20 years as an official of the United Nations and of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, he has advised many governments and organizations on human rights, inter-ethnic relations, political transitions, and peace processes. John will be speaking to the changing global context and the need for extradition reform. Then I will be introducing and showing our short video summarizing the case of Hassan Diab, the issues with the Extradition Act, and presenting the Halifax proposals for extradition reform, as well as what action people can take. Next, we will have Rob Curie, who is a professor of law and university, university research professor at the Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie University. He is a specialist in transnational and cross-border criminal law, and his scholarly work in this field is regularly cited by courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada. Rob is also one of the authors and key organizers of the Halifax proposals. He will elaborate on the proposals and share examples of more cases that demonstrate why reform is so necessary. Our last panelist will be Sherry Aiken, a law professor at Queen's University and co-editor in chief of PKI Global Justice Journal. She has supported for many years now civil society efforts calling for reform of Canadian extradition law. This includes participating in a chain fast in support of Dr. Hassan Diab in 2017. And more recently, she was one of the uh, 118 18 signatories to the ICLMG open letter calling for suspension of Canada's extradition treaty with France. She will conclude by speaking to concerns around violations of law norms of due process, fairness, and human rights. Thank you to all our panelists for being here. Thank you to the attendees. Uh, John, the Zoom floor is yours. Merci beaucoup, Anne. Uh, thank you very much for uh, the generous introduction. Uh, so just with the uh, limited time I have, uh, as Anne has set out, my, my contribution is essentially to draw attention to the uh, contextualization of, uh, of the Halifax proposals uh, in one respect, and that is the changed uh, circumstances or nature of the world in which uh, we now live, and, uh, and really to underline the urgency of updating and, and uh, making fit for purpose uh, an, an extradition act of Canada in this uh, complex and dangerous world. Um, uh, let me uh, uh, first of all not be remiss in acknowledging the uh, Algonquin land from which I'm addressing you here at the University of Ottawa. Uh, it's also, as you can see uh, from the uh, video behind me, screen behind me, it's the 40th anniversary of our Human Rights Research and Education Centre, and this week, the 40th anniversary of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which was adopted on the 17th uh, or promulgated on the 17th 
of, uh, of April uh, 1982. So um, allow, allow me to make that connection explicit uh, that uh, our, our country, Canada, uh, in our constitution entrenches uh, human rights, which are uh, conceptually to be inalienable and fundamental and apply to not only Canadian citizens, but all persons within our jurisdiction. Uh, and these include, among other things, uh, a guarantee of a right to fair trial, a due process of law, uh, which uh, is exactly in doubt now in, uh, in regard of a number of cases, uh, but generally uh, because, of the, uh, because of the intersection with extradition uh, arrangements uh, that we have with different countries in the world. Uh, so this is actually a, a pretty serious matter because there aren't many, there aren't many more things that can place uh, an individual more vulnerable than their removal from their country or the country uh, which uh, is committed to uh, ensure these protections and to place them uh, in, the, in the hands of others for whom that guarantee may not either apply or not be uh, reliable. Um, so when I'm talking about making fit for purpose, let's just remember that the current law was elaborated about and adopted about a quarter of a century ago. And in that period of time, in that quarter century, uh, I would suggest to you that the world has changed significantly and uh, not in a way, unfortunately, as we can see on our televisions, which is, uh, is necessarily happier or more pleasant. Aside from many things we know, for example, the development of social media, cryptocurrencies, the complex interdependencies of the world, phenomena of transnational crime, of uh, transnational repression, um, and, and very simply, uh, a rough world uh, where blatant breaches of international uh, law, fundamental tenets, uh, and, and, of, uh, and of bilateral agreements uh, now seem uh, all too commonplace. Uh, and that's the world we're increasingly living in. Uh, Freedom House, the reputable American NGO, uh, has reported 16 consecutive years of the reduction and the diminution of uh, democracies in the world such that there's a bare handful of countries in the world they now identify as fully free, Canada amongst them, but not even our neighboring country, the US. In fact, the last three years, the annual reports of Freedom House have been subtitled in 2018, Democracy in Crisis, in 2019, A Leaderless Struggle for Democracy, and this last year, 2021, uh, the, the even more disturbing subtitle, Democracy Under Siege. So that's the world we're living in, where uh, if we look at uh, those countries that are included amongst uh, democracies, we saw the elections in Hungary this last week. We know that Poland was uh, uh, barely six or eight weeks ago on the verge of being suspended uh, uh, as a result of its own uh, from the, in the EU as a res uh, certain um, breaches of the rule of law uh, in, the, in the EU. We know what the election just uh, on Sunday in France uh, potentially portends and so forth. Our world is, is obviously in flux and dangerous, and many Canadians come to Canada or maintain relations abroad, either through family or business or different ways of travel and so forth, that they are subject to the, uh, I would say, imponderables of potential demands for extradition and so forth, and the risk of a forcible transfer from our country into those, uh, those uh, circumstances. So the old century assumptions of things like comity, courtesy, essentially, a gentleman's respect for others, is not reliable. Uh, in fact, I'd say the opposite, shamelessness now typifies a lot of uh, international relations, uh, securitization, uh, and, and constraints on a vigorous, scrupulous respect of the rule of law. So from this perspective, let me just conclude by saying that we have a duty in Canada to ensure that our laws, at least within the reach of our jurisdictions, absolutely scrupulously respect our constitutional obligations, our charter of rights and freedoms, and our international obligations. And therefore, the Extradition Law Act of Canada needs to be reformed and to be reformed with urgency. Uh, I'm happy now to defer to my colleagues who will speak to that in terms of the many and useful proposals in the Halifax proposals. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, as I said at the beginning, the mandate of the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group is to monitor the impact 
of government actions around anti-terrorism and national security on our civil liberties. Um, therefore, our coalition's focus on the extradition law is how it intersects with anti-terrorism. So we've mostly worked on the case of Hassan Diab, who is a professor in Ottawa and Canadian citizen who was wrongly extradited to France in relation to a terror attack on a synagogue in France in 1980. He was never charged and the French investigative, investigative judge found evidence that he was not even in France during the attack. He was finally released and returned to Canada in 2018 after three years uh, in prison in solitary, con solitary confinement. His struggle for justice continues as the French government appeal his release and the judiciary has recently set an April 2023 date for Dr. Diab's trial. This is absolutely shocking and, ex and inexplicable revo reversal of the January 2018 decision clearing Dr. Diab of all accusations and freeing him unconditionally. France continues to France continues its baseless prosecution more than four years after Hassan was exonerated by French anti-terrorism magistrate. So today we are launching a new educational and action video which summarizes the issues with the Extradition Act, presents the recommendations of the Halifax proposal on how to reform it using the case of Hassan Diab as a frame. At the end, there is an action that you can all take and share wi widely to urge the federal government to reform the Extradition Extradition Act. I will put the link to it in the chat. There is also a lot more to learn about the Kafkaesque case of Hassan Diab, which uh, we haven't time to cover it in, uh, in the, this video. Uh, I would also put links to, uh, to that information in the chat for more information as well as an action you can take. Without further ado, let's watch our new video. Rob, could you please share the video now? Hi, my name is Anne and I work at the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group. Today I want to talk to you about extradition in Canada. First, what is extradition? It's the legal process by which the Canadian government sends individuals, including Canadian citizens and permanent residents, to face criminal prosecution and incarceration in foreign countries. Why do I want to talk about it? Because the extradition process in Canada is broken. One of Canada's leading extradition experts calls it the least fair law in Canada. It is discretionary and political, lacks transparency, and is stacked against the person facing extradition. It has real devastating impacts. Take the case of Hassan Diab. In 2014, Hassan Diab, a Canadian citizen, was wrongfully extradited to France and held in solitary confinement in a maximum security prison for over three years. He was eventually released without ever being formally charged after a French judge found that the case against Dr. Diab was profoundly flawed and that evidence showed he was not even in France on the day the crime he was suspected of occurred. The judge overseeing the extradition hearings in Canada called the French case weak, very problematic, very confusing, with conclusions that are suspect, and stated that a conviction seems unlikely. Despite all this, Canadian officials aggressively pursued Dr. Diab's extradition. Media inquiries eventually produced evidence of concerted efforts by Canadian Justice Department lawyers to shore up the French case, including by withholding exculpatory evidence, which the Extradition Act currently allows. Hassan Diab's case is emblematic of a process that has been reduced to a rubber stamp. It needs to change. The problems with Canada's extradition system can be broken down into four parts. One, the committal process where courts decide if a person will be extradited to face trial or not is unfairly biased in favor of the foreign state. It doesn't allow the person sought to introduce exculpatory evidence. It assumes evidence presented by the foreign state to be reliable, and it permits extradition and deprivation of liberty on the basis of unreliable material that would not be accepted in a Canadian criminal court. Two, 
The decision to surrender a person to extradition made by the Minister of Justice is the product of a discretionary and explicitly political process, which is also unfairly weighted toward extradition and against the rights of the person sought. 3. Justice Canada's International Assistant Group, or IAG, is excessively adversarial in the way it conducts extradition proceedings, focusing on winning cases when they are not actually meant to serve as prosecutors. Even more troubling, the IAG both assists the foreign state in making its case and advises the Minister of Justice on whether extradition should be granted, so it acts as both the prosecutor and the judge. And four, Canada's international cooperation on criminal investigations is generally conducted under a veil of unnecessary secrecy and lack of transparency is a serious problem. In 2018, a group of seven legal and human rights experts gathered for the Halifax Colloquium and put together a set of 12 recommendations to reform Canada's broken extradition system. 1. The Extradition Act and related policies should be amended in accordance with three general principles. Fundamental fairness, transparency, and a rebalancing of roles, both between the courts and the government, and between charter protection and administrative efficiency. 2. It should not be presumed that states with which Canada has extradition relations will act in good faith. Explicit safeguards against countries that issue extradition requests for political reasons should be put in place. 3. The committal process should incorporate the presumption of innocence. It should also allow the person sought to meaningfully challenge the reliability of the case against them, in particular exculpatory evidence in the hands of either the requesting state or the Canadian government must be disclosed. 4. The minister's surrender decisions should be subject to a higher standard of review. Some of the questions in the surrender phase should be considered by the courts and not by the government. For example, whether the individual sought would face double jeopardy, prosecution for political crime such as treason, unfair trial, serious mistreatment including torture, or other unjust or oppressive treatment. 5. Surrender should only be permitted if the requesting state shows evidence it is ready to take the case to trial. 6. Canada's obligations under international human rights law should be taken explicitly into account throughout the process. 7. If there are concerns about the treatment of individuals in the requesting state and diplomatic assurances are used to facilitate surrender, they must be meaningful, transparent, monitored, and legally enforceable. 8. The role of the International Assistant Group should be reformulated so that its members work to obtain a fair and just result in each case rather than a win. 9. There should be oversight of the International Assistant Group and meaningful public scrutiny of its activities and of the extradition process generally. 10. In cases where Canada could prosecute, extradition should be barred in favor of Canadian prosecution unless the government can prove that it is actually in the interest of justice to extradite. This would give meaning to Section 6 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which states that every Canadian citizen has a right to remain in Canada. 11. All of Canada's extradition arrangements with foreign countries should be reviewed and subjected to public scrutiny on an ongoing basis. As a starting point, Canada should not have extradition treaties with countries that have records of human rights abuse and have failed to ratify human rights treaties. And 12. The government of Canada should heed the repeated calls to dedicate more resources to investigating and extraditing alleged perpetrators of international crimes such as genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes and torture who are present on Canadian territory. It is crucial that the government acts to fix Canada's flawed extradition system. You can take two actions today to change the system. 1. Share this video with friends and family. And 2. Send a letter to the Prime Minister, the Justice Minister and your MP by visiting islmg.ca. If you'd like to read the full Halifax Colloquium report and learn more about Hassan Diab's case and his fight for justice, check out the links we've included in the video description. ISLMG is a Canadian coalition of 45 national civil society groups that came together after the adoption of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2001 to protect civil liberties from the negative impact of the so-called War on Terror. To see more videos like this one and support our work of protecting civil liberties in general, please visit islmg.ca. Donate or patreon.com slash isolmg and get rewards. Thank you.
Thank you for sharing the video, Rob. Um, a reminder that I've put the video and action links in the chat uh, for you all to take action and share. And um, that's it from, for me. Uh, Rob Curry is next. Please take it away. Thanks very much, Anne. Um, it's not the first time I've seen the video, but I'm struck by, um, by how well and professionally prepared it is, but also the information that's conveyed uh, both about the Diop case and about the Halifax proposals is uh, significant. I, I recommend it for, for circulating. I recommend it for re-watching uh, as well, because it, it's, a, it's a big information dump, but there is a lot to say uh, on this topic. And I should apologize for manipulating the, the screen while, while it was playing. I dug into the chat to make sure that the link was there and then subsequently realized that you could see me doing that. So here we are living in this uh, pandemic Zoom world. Um, a couple of things, I I'm only gonna take a few minutes to try to uh, put a bit of meat on the bones of, of the discussion here. One thing I, I think it's worth saying is that we, uh, we have often fastened on this statement by a leading extradition uh, expert that, that the statute is the least fair law in Canada. I just want to acknowledge publicly here that that's Gary Botting. Uh, who has been fighting in the extradition trenches uh, out in British Columbia for many years. Uh, Gary is probably the most experienced uh, extradition defense lawyer uh, in this country, author of some leading publications on the topic. So uh, Gary, I think, deserves uh, acknowledgement for, uh, for that statement, which we have all seen fit to use, I think, because it's so colorful and not despite the fact that it's that so colorful. Um, another point uh, to make maybe uh, especially where this discussion is about the reform of extradition law is to acknowledge that extradition is not a bad thing in itself. In principle, extradition is a good thing and we want our governments to engage in it uh, because it's, it's a, an absolutely essential mechanism for fighting transnational crime in the world, for fighting crime that crosses uh, borders and ensuring that criminals who uh, commit offenses in one country and escape to another uh, don't end up with impunity. So I, I would go so far as to say as our governments around the world are obliged to have a very serious criminal justice system to protect us all from the pernicious effects of crime. So extradition is not a bad thing by itself. It's a good thing. Everything, of course, hinges on how it is done. And that is, uh, that is what has been shifting in the last few decades uh, particularly along with the changes, the challenges to democracy that John spoke of so eloquently. Um, and in the end, uh, extradition depends very much on how individual countries do it. So th that is the reason that we are focusing on Canada's extradition law today. Not that that extradition in principle needs to be corrected or, or amended or modified, but that Canada needs to change how we do it because that is where the unfairness uh, comes in. Um, Hassan Diab's case is, is appropriately described as Kafkaesque, um, and there's really no other word uh, for it. And when I've been asked, you know, what is at the heart of this extradition reform project that has been going on for a number of years now, I always say that the, the starting point, uh, the, not just the rhetorical, but a substantial starting point is this, an extradition law that allowed Hassan Diab to be extradited to France for a crime he manifestly did not commit is an extradition law that needs to be changed. So frankly, the entire, for me, the entire, entire reform agenda flows from that simple statement. Uh, it's a horrendous case. Dr. Diab's uh, uh, life has been upended, his family has been targeted. Uh, he has been unfairly persecuted by France with the active assistance of the government of Canada uh, through the uh, very troubling administration of laws that have problems, have some fundamental flaws. I say that because one thing I try to do in, in discussing this with, uh, with people who are, who are learning about extradition and extradition reform is to say, there's a lot you should be angry about here. There are a lot of things that would disturb Canadians if they were informed of them. And that has been part of our agenda is to inform people about what's actually going on in what is really kind of an obscure backwater of the law. Um, at the very least, it was until the, Meng, uh, the Meng Wanzhou uh, 
case, which uh, kind of put extradition on the, uh, on, on the front page of every newspaper in Canada. So people have heard of extradition now. And I think a lot of Canadians are aware that the Meng Wanzhou case had some very difficult political aspects to it. Uh, Canada was essentially dropped into a, uh, an international firefight between the US and China, quite unfairly so, I think. Um, and so we see there how extradition can become politicized uh, on the international scale, and, and that's problematic. But I've got a number of other cases that I want to quickly run through just to give a sense of what's wrong with this act, quite beyond the Hassan Diab case. Uh, the leading case in Canada on extradition from the Supreme Court of Canada dealt with the, uh, the case of Michelle Messina, who escaped from her abusive husband uh, in the US and, 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 and you know, came back to Canada, to Quebec, where she was from, uh, with her children. She was charged there with child abduction and was sought for extradition. Now, if Ms. Messina had been prosecuted in Canada, she would have had access to a defense, uh, to the defense of necessity and, and argued that her actions were in protection of her children. That defense was not going to be available to her in the US. So essentially she was going to be uh, prosecuted based on what there was very strong evidence uh, for the proposition that she had <clears throat> simply been protecting her children. Um, but the, the government of Canada fought the case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada twice. And, and in the end, the Minister of Justice ordered Michelle Messina extradited. She died by suicide in prison three weeks later, rather than be extradited to the US. Profoundly disturbing, profoundly wrong. A case where she would essentially have been undoubted or, or most likely declared innocent in Canada. Uh, that defense was not even available to her. Some of you may have heard of uh, the case of Abdullah Khadr, uh, a member of the infamous Khadr family who was picked up in um, Afghanistan some years back by the Pakistani secret services who were acting under a bounty that had been placed on Khadr's head by the CIA. That's a disturbing fact right there. They took him into custody. He was mistreated uh, up to the level of torture with the act of collaboration of the CIA. Um, and, and the government of Pakistan, government officials interfered with Canada's ability to get access to Mr. Cotter, who was a Canadian citizen. Uh, eventually, he did make his way home. Well, he, he was brought home by, by Canada, by uh, uh, officials from CSIS and the RCMP. When he got back to Canada, the United States, having been actively complicit in his mistreatment, had the temerity to make an extradition request uh, for him. And the International Assistance Group at Justice Canada, again, fought this case all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. They were stopped by the Ontario Court of Appeal uh, that said the US cannot come to Canada with dirty hands like this and seek extradition. And yet, and yet the government of Canada went to the Supreme Court of Canada to try to get leave. Another problematic case. Um, 2012, uh, the case of uh, Leonard and Gionet, two Indigenous men from Ontario who were sought by the U.S. for extradition on drug charges. The sentencing laws that they faced in the U.S. did not take their Indigenous status into account, which is a, a fundamental component of Canadian sentencing law, um, and they resisted extradition on that basis. Nonetheless, the government of Canada fought this as hard as they could until the Ontario Court of Appeals said, no, it would breach their charter rights to extradite them to face that situation. <clears throat> uh, a Jordanian man named Jerish Kumzie, who also uh, is a, was a resident of Canada, uh, was charged with murder in the US, um, a murder that had, that had taken place in the US and was sought for extradition there. But the interesting thing about that case was that Mr. Kumzie had also, had already been prosecuted for that murder uh, back home. And he had been prosecuted, he had been convicted, he had served time in prison. Uh, he didn't serve as long a sentence as he might have because of the generalized amnesty that, that occurred, but he served his time, he was convicted. The US nonetheless sought his extradition and Canada and our courts went along with it. So we call that double jeopardy, right? And we, we call it something a little different here in Canada and the Americans call it double jeopardy. It's entirely problematic to try somebody twice for the same crime. But nobody seemed to care about that. Uh, that seemed to be OK. Um, I don't want to take too much time. There are so many of these cases. But I, I think it's important to raise awareness about them. There are a number of cases in Canada, 
where people have been extradited again to the U.S. to face a sentence of life without parole. There are some U.S. states and there are some crimes under which people can, can achieve or achieve, can be given the sentence of uh, life in prison without any chance of parole. In Canada, that is a charter breaching um, uh, kind of sentence. It, we, we view it as antithetical to the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, that sentence is almost exclusively not available in Canada. Nonetheless, it, for some reason, it's felt to be okay that we extradite people to face that sentence elsewhere. Um, uh, another case, a recent one, Brady Hillis, a case that went to the Ontario Court of Appeal, he was sought for extradition to the US for a crime. And had he committed the crime in Canada, the sentence he would have faced would have been between 90 days and three years in prison. In the US, he was facing a sentence of 30 years. And yet, somehow, it was okay to extradite him to face that potential uh, sentence. That was a reasonable decision on the part of the Minister of Justice, or so said the Ontario Court of Appeal in that case. All of this is to say nothing about the many cases where people have been extradited to countries where the prison conditions are shocking. Uh, prison conditions doesn't seem to be something that uh, our government or our courts are concerned about. Uh, nonetheless, you know, this is a human rights concern that consistently is not taken into account in, uh, under the way Canada's extradition laws are, are applied. So, I, I, I again suggest that all of those cases are indicators of exactly the problems that we highlighted in the Halifax principles, which were that there is manifest unfairness in various parts uh, of our of Canada's extradition laws. And as the video suggested, the, uh, the Halifax principles were the product of uh, a serious amount of thinking and writing and formulating on the part of, uh, of our group, which was a mixture of academics, human rights advocates, defense lawyers, uh, people with expertise in extradition and in human rights. Uh, it is a serious law reform proposal. And that was always the goal with the Halifax proposals. It's not simply a, a highlighting of what's wrong with our extradition law, though that is certainly a significant amount of its content. But there is also the basis for a, 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 a detailed, and very uh, contemplative and serious law reform conversation that Parliament needs to have. And I, I think I'll conclude on this point. The thing that motivated the Halifax group to put together a law reform proposal was this. Diab's case, among all of these others that I've mentioned, demonstrate that our extradition law, as we do it here in Canada, is fundamentally broken. And there's really going to be no other way to fix it than for Parliament to become engaged and for the people of Canada to become more aware of this law, how it operates, and to have input into what it should look like. And as John mentioned, we're nearly a quarter century past the passing of this Extradition Act. Uh, we've seen how it operates. We know now that it is not fit for purpose. There are serious flaws, fundamental flaws, that, uh, that need to be fixed. And so that, that is the goal that we, uh, we have come into this with, and we're hopeful that the government of Canada will take us up on the, on the need to have conversation and ultimately parliamentary scrutiny of the Extradition Act with an eye to amending it and parliamentary scrutiny of Canada's international extradition practice, including what countries we sign treaties with and what the conditions for extradition are that we allow and to review those so that we're sure that this very liberty infringing intrusive legal process is done in and executed in accordance with charter values and the kinds of fairness and transparency of process that Canadians uh, can expect from their government. So that's it for me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, don't forget everyone to put your questions in the Q&A box if you have any. And uh, last but not least, uh, Sherry can please take it away. Thank you, Anne. Uh, so I want to focus a little bit on uh, the Extradition Act itself and why it's so broken at the very sort of end stage of the extradition procedure, which involves the Minister of Justice themselves. Uh, 
And so I'm just screen sharing for a moment. Um, uh, and I, I wanna just take you through the reasons which the act says the minister um, uh, may reference if they uh, want to decide not to, to grant an extradition order. Um, and first to situate this conversation in uh, what's really at stake here. It's a deprivation of liberty, right? And as Rob said, extradition is a good thing. We're not against extradition. Extradition serves the objectives of justice and ensures that um, uh, fugitives um, are not essentially accorded impunity. So we're in favor of extradition, but extradition needs to have safeguards in order to protect rights. And indeed the deprivation of liberty is the most fundamental of violations when it comes to human rights. Um, a, a, a question or a right that was guaranteed, you know, all the way back, um, uh, you know, to the, the mid uh, 1400s um, with the Magna Carta. Um, liberty is the bedrock of human rights, and that's what's at stake here. So what happens after a judge has examined um, uh, the evidence uh, proffered by the requesting state? The matter goes up to the Minister of Justice to decide whether or not the individual should actually be surrendered. And here's the reasons when an order for extradition should not be made. First of all, you can see here that the minister shall refuse to make a surrender order if it would be unjust or oppressive, having regard to all the relevant circumstances. But you'll note that there's no definition of unjust or oppressive. And indeed, there are no uh, guidelines in the public domain to inform how the interpretation of unjust and oppressive <laughs> should be made. Um, nor is there a preamble in the Extradition Act itself that situates the decision-making process in terms of international treaty rights at stake. Okay, so that's the first thing to mention. Secondly, the minister shall grant, uh, shall refuse to grant a surrender order if it's made for the purpose of prosecuting or punishing a person for a very uh, wide array of um, uh, classic discrimination grounds. Um, so everything from race, religion, nationality, uh, to sexual orientation, age, mental or physical disability or status. So very broad um, uh, uh, discrimination clause which is a good thing. Um, but once again, no reference to how um, uh, the record of the requesting state is to be examined. Um, and um, uh, no guidelines in relation to assessing the evidence um, that extradition might engage one of these grounds. Then I want to, um, I'm not going to review all of the clauses in the act, but I, but I actually um, uh, want to go down to just the very uh, next clause, which um, identifies when the minister may refuse to make an order. So Article uh, 44 uh, sub 1 is mandatory, whereas uh, subsection 2 is entirely discretionary. The minister may refuse to make an order um, where uh, the individual may be subject to the death penalty. But you'll see it's discretionary. And indeed, Canadian case law has affirmed that although generally uh, Canada neither deports nor extradites to a country where somebody is at risk uh, of receiving the death penalty, the courts have left an open door for quote unquote exceptional circumstances. Um, with again, no guidance as to what constitutes exceptional. And it, it deserves mention that um, uh, subjecting individuals to the death penalty um, and relatedly something called the, the death row phenomenon, which is the idea that somebody may be um, in, in effect subject to an indefinite sentence, um, uh, there's um, uh, been little um, uh, structure to this uh, wide discretion. Furthermore, um, courts have consistently identified these powers in the Extradition Act as questions of executive discretion, which engage matters of comity, right? So it's all about foreign affairs, uh, the courts underscore, 
And yet it's the Minister of Justice making the decision, not the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And the Minister of Justice is making a legal assessment of the human rights record of the requesting state with no safeguards built into the act, no administrative guidelines in the public domain to guide the exercise of this executive discretion. And once the decision is made, it's virtually unreviewable as a result of the very um, uh, uh, strong strain in the jurisprudence not to interfere uh, with this essentially political decision. In other words, to grant in a very high degree of deference to the minister's decision. So all those cases that Rob referenced um, uh, a few moments ago, um, the safeguard supposedly for all those individuals uh, was at the level of the ministerial decision to surrender when their human rights concerns were, were to be considered where other um, mistreatment feared was supposed to be part of the equation. And yet we saw how time and time again, um, at the level of the, the minister, safeguards weren't enacted. Um, and indeed, um, when anyone ever attempts to challenge uh, the surrender decision in court, there's very little that's offered up by way of um, a record of decision-making um, to determine the criteria upon which the minister's decision is actually informed. And what I really wanna emphasize here is that all of this stands in stark contrast um, to the way in which individuals are deported under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act. Now, for those of you that know my work, I'm no fan of Canada's removal procedures. I think they too lack safeguards, but by comparison, Canada's deportation scheme, um, which most often um, impacts foreign nationals, not Canadian citizens, uh, has way more safeguards built in. First of all, um, the decision to remove itself, a legal decision, is made not uh, exclusively by the minister, but through a process um, uh, that's guided and structured through regulation and through administrative policy. Um, and secondly, um, uh, the safeguard of judicial review is available. So I won't go into the nitty gritty details of all this, but I wanna sum up by emphasizing that um, the uh, two-stage extradition procedure is deeply flawed, deeply broken, and the safeguards that are supposed to exist at the level of the ministerial decision are virtually non-existent as a result of the act's failure uh, to elaborate those safeguards. So there's no question in my view that law reform is necessary. And I'll um, end there and look forward to discussing uh, further details in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Sherry. Thank you to all our panelists for your important insightful contributions. Uh, we'll be taking questions now. There's already a few in the Q&A, so I'll just go through those. Um, Rob, I saw you answered the first one. Um, I don't know if you would like uh, in a written form, but I don't know if you, and uh, Sherry spoke to it a bit in her presentation. Uh, the question was posed before uh, you started. Um, but I'm just gonna read the question and Rob, if you wanna expand on your answer. Listening to the problems that you have outlined, it seems like the oversight of the extradition decisions is rightly with the courts who can review the minister's decisions. Can't the court discharge for extradition where there are human rights concerns that you have outlined? Yeah, and, and I answered the question there um, and I'll just summarize by saying yes, and they sometimes do. Uh, there are cases where the courts have uh, been able to stop extradition on human rights grounds. Um, the problem is, though, with how the act is, is framed often, because the courts, of course, are there to interpret the, the will of Parliament, and they say that the act reflects the will of Parliament. Uh, so that really ties their hands to an extent. And as Sherry discussed as well, a, a thing I didn't mention in my written answer is that this is an area of law where the courts are so deferential. Uh, to the minister because, and based simply on the government's argument that, well, this involves foreign relations, so courts, you need to keep your hands off of this. You can't be messing uh, 
with the federal prerogative around foreign relations, which has the effect of removing it from the human rights table uh, effectively, except in the most uh, egregious cases. Now, I, I will say that there, one thing we know, we only know this anecdotally. But one thing we know is that the International Assistance Group does screen out extradition requests or frankly turn them down when there is really problematic stuff on the other side. We know that happens, but as I say, anecdotally, because they don't publish any data. Uh, they occasionally uh, respond to uh, freedom of information requests, but it, it's a big black box. It's hard to get information uh, out of. I think it would be very useful if we could have a sense uh, of how many states make requests every year and how, how those requests are, are actually dealt with and the, the bases on which IAG refuses them. There's a certain amount of state to state confidentiality that has to be maintained and that's absolutely fine. That's a recognized form of, of privilege, but a lot more, a lot more could happen there. Uh, I see the, the first question that's open at the moment is how many extradition cases are refused every year? Do they all go before the courts? The answer is most are not, most are not refused. Uh, every year, but they, they do not all go through the courts for uh, for the reason that I uh, that I mentioned. Uh, some of them don't get to court, but the ones that do go to court, which is the majority of them, the government of Canada goes to the mat every time, and they litigate as hard as they can to make extradition happen. And I'll just add that it's important to understand that um, the vast majority of <laughs> of sort of the court hearing it is not in relation to the individual's human rights at stake. Um, rather, it's, it's a hearing in relation to the, the evidence uh, being proffered by the requesting state um, and um, getting into court on questions of the treatment feared by the individual if extradited is a much more difficult matter um, because it involves judicial review um, and the whole sort of um, uh, question of access to judicial review is, is a real barrier to litigation. Thank you. Uh, the next question, um, okay, I'm just gonna read it. One of the effects of COVID on the courts has been to, it's been the increased capacity, not just in Canada, but in multiple jurisdictions to conduct court proceedings via video. A notable example of this capacity is a recent Meng Wangzhou uh, extradition case in which Mr. Ms. Wangzhou was able to be present in a court in New York over video from a BC court and enter a guilty plea without being extradited. How does the advancement of such technological capacity of courts impact the justification for extradition in any case where such technology is available? So we, you know, we mentioned um, uh, video proceedings in the Halifax proposals and we mentioned it in the context of the extradition hearing itself, because the act only provides that the, the requesting state has to uh, give Canada's courts a very limited summary of the evidence they actually have, which is not how things were done traditionally. And one thing we proposed is the requesting state should be made to actually uh, give a more robust version of what evidence they have and this can involve the testimony of live witnesses in this day and age, for heaven's sake. You know, they can appear over, uh, over video. So the, and I'm not suggesting that an extradition hearing in Canada should amount to a criminal trial, but the requesting state should, uh, should, should and can be able to present the major witnesses uh, before uh, that they're using in the prosecution in order that our court can look at that witness and say, okay, is there actually something like reliable evidence here? Because at the moment, it's an entirely paper exercise for the most part. They simply read a, a summary of the evidence that's available. They accept that that's true. It's presumed that that evidence is reliable. Uh, and, and then away, away it goes. So that would be very helpful. Uh, the idea of conducting criminal prosecutions by way of video link is problematic because uh, states pretty much insist on having the accused uh, on their territory in their courtroom when the, when the criminal prosecution happens, uh, apart from jurisdictions that occasionally do prosecutions in absentia. But there's great use to be made of modern technology uh, throughout the process. So yeah, I, I wholly agree with this, uh, with this questioner. 
Okay, the next question, thank you so much. The next question is uh, regarding proposal 10 of the Halifax proposals, the citizenship actually matter if the allege offense has been committed in Canada. Um, if the allege offense has been committed in Canada, why does the accused citizenship matter at all? Um, okay. So, sorry, I, I'm, I'm jumping in every time. Sherry and John, I obviously love to hear from you as well. This one is a bit technical. Section six of the charter says that Canadian citizens have the right to remain in Canada. Um, now, Canadian citizens can be extradited. The courts have held that it's a breach of your section six right to be extradited, but that it's, it's a justifiable breach under section one of the charter, which is fine. But the way that's supposed to proceed is that Canada is meant to do an assessment in these cases of whether Canada is best place to extradite or whether the requesting state is extradite, which means this is actually a narrow, a narrow uh, band of cases where two countries would have jurisdiction to extradite. Right? That, that's an unusual kind of case. It's not unheard of, I mean, it's unusual, um, usually because it's a cross-border case of, 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 in some way, you know, the, somebody who uh, initiated a phone call on one side of the border to get a criminal conspiracy going, but they were talking to somebody on the other side of the border. That's a crime that happens on both sides of the border. Uh, in those cases, with Canadian citizens, the idea is that Canada should assess, should we prosecute or should we extradite to the requesting state? What actually happens is every time the government decides, uh, yes, it's better if the requesting state prosecute. So our section six rights in this context are meaningless because it's set up as a formalistic exercise that always justifies uh, extradition. So we do propose some, uh, some changes to that in the Halifax proposals. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what is the relationship between Extradition Act and extradition treaties with various foreign states? Why Canada is ready to extradite its citizens to the countries which, as a matter of principles, do not extradite theirs, uh, like as in the example of France, right? Um, who would like to answer that? That's a good question for John, I thought. Not to put you on the spot. If I understand the question is why or why not, uh... You know, this is, I guess, the prerogative of a state uh, to to decide, but it strikes me as manifestly stupid. <laughs> so, um, you know, why why would we make an agreement with a state that that uh, would not reciprocate? I mean, one of the most rudimentary elements of uh, international relations historically has been the principle of reciprocity. You know, I, I you know, di diplomatic law is founded on that. We exchange. Um, uh, envoys and uh, uh, a lot of humanitarian laws based on similar ideas and so forth. So I, 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 I'm not so sure of the actual practice in Canada, but to my understanding, uh, we, we are ready to extradite to certainly countries that do not have the same um, standards of guarantees. Uh, so that's another kind of inequality uh, uh, in terms of the relationship. Um, and, and I'm not sure, but I actually have from, from this, I have another question to my colleagues, uh, because we know that, for example, um, countries, for example, France, which has come up, uh, France has extradition agreement with China. Uh, once, uh, did, are there limitations on, on once we surrender or transfer someone into the jurisdiction of, for example, France, for the purposes in which they're in France? Are they actually out of the control of Canada in that respect? I mean, might they also be subjected to extradition to a third place as a result of the process of an extradition agreement between third countries? I can ask you an see, answer to that question. You, uh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, there, in, often in our extradition treaties, there's a clause that deals with re-extradition. Re That's the phrase that describes exactly what you just put forward. And the idea, uh, I don't think it's in all our treaties, and it should be. Uh, the idea is once the prosecution of the individual is, uh, is finished and they're released, uh, they're meant to have the freedom to leave that country before being re-extradited. And they tend to, usually is like a three-month period or, or something like that. So uh, 
it you know it's dealt with that problem. Uh, I would say not in as uniform a way as as would be appropriate. Um, and just to fall back on the on the extradition of nationals thing, I agree with, with what John said, and this is a perennial problem in international extradition relations, which is that some countries, usually countries from the civil law tradition, don't extradite their nationals. They're they're constitutionally uh, impaired from extraditing their nationals. So we have a treaty with France, which is one of those which is one of those countries. So France will not extradite French citizens back here. They will extradite foreign citizens back here, including any Canadians who uh, who make their way to France. But the idea is meant to be, of course, that a state that doesn't extradite its nationals is meant to prosecute them there if they're if they're going to refuse to extradite. And in principle, that that happens because they exercise extraterritorial jurisdiction over their citizens. In practice, it's very problematic. Uh, they, the energy often doesn't seem to be there, uh, especially with France. France is, is quite an offender there. So I think, as John has said, the principle of reciprocity uh, is paramount in international law just to make it uh, democratically tenable for, uh, for Canadians you know, who are being represented by our government in this regard. So it's something that needs further scrutiny, for sure. And what I think it also highlights is the disjuncture, right? Because on the one hand, the courts um, adopt a hands-off approach to reviewing the actual surrender decision um, in the name of, of comity, in the name of international cooperation. And yet when we unpack all of this, we see that it's not actually about reciprocity at all um, in many cases. Um, so we have something dressed up um, a, as a matter of foreign affairs and, and virtually unreviewable at the surrender stage, um, but not actually um, uh, rooted or anchored in uh, that principle at all. So um, it's just yet another signpost, I think, of the injustice here. Thank you, everyone. Could I just um, jump in there to, uh, uh, and I'm sorry, I, I got uh, disconnected, so I missed some part, but uh, was, uh, has anyone treated the question as regard of the, of the possibilities of repair in these cases? Because to my observation is that it's uh, almost impossible. Uh, I mean, we're, we're seeing this, never mind, uh, let me say, even with a good faith, goodwill kind of commitment, harms which are done in terms of uh, um, uh, to the individuals that we, uh, as uh, Rabna just mentioned, uh, the Article 6 guarantees in, in the, or Section 6 guarantees in our own con uh, constitution that may, that may, um, uh, that should be uh, uh, balanced against uh, an extradition request. In, in my view, I, I actually think that can't properly be fully squared in my view. I know, I know that that's the, the proposition, uh, but, but what happens in, in all these cases where, where a person is then, uh, the process is uh, not up to scratch, does not uh, uh, coincide with the promise, uh, you know, with, with, with this idea of comedy in, in fact, in the actual conduct uh, is, not, uh, is not sustained. I, I mean, uh, is there a long practice of, of forms of repair, or, or is it a kind of good luck and uh, see you later? You mean repair in the sense of a domestic remedy, John? Like if you're, if you're extradited under a, a dodgy process? Yeah, well, like, exactly. I mean, if, if, I'm, if, I'm, if I am personally extradited, I've traveled a lot of places in the world and, and I have quite a few people in certain countries that may not be very happy about things I've done <laughs> or said. I don't want to be subjected to this, and then, then in in you know the exercise of their state authority, uh, my uh, Canada extradites me somewhere, and the whole thing goes very uh, square and shouldn't have happened, and so forth. Like, what what is the repair that that I uh, reparation I seek in that regard, and is it actually? Uh, I mean, do we have reliable reference to it? I mean, I'm not going to get back my. We, we know it's going to be in the realm of compensation and so forth, but. Are, are we talking about something totally fictional? Hmm. Well, because I mean, it would I, suggest I, I, that if it is, then the bar needs to be extremely high. That's my point. Yeah. If well, there's no know, meaningful repair. As you know, Dr. Diab is, is suing the government of Canada uh, for exactly in, the, in this regard. And I, I don't think anything's happened with that. But 
uh, you know, the I think the answer uh, is your goose is pretty much cooked uh, if you are extradited. Uh, and I, the one horror story I can think of is a gentleman. Now his name escapes me, but he was extradited to Mexico. Uh, it was a very difficult case because he had done some very bad things, gotten himself into trouble in the in the prison in Mexico. In fact, had been broken out of the prison, made his way back to Canada, was extradited back to Mexico on the assurance from the government of Mexico that a he would not uh, would not be uh, sent to the same prison he had been busted out of, and b that he would not be tortured. So the government of Mexico assured the government of Canada of both of those things. He was sent to that prison and he was tortured. And when he got back to Canada, nothing. And uh, he has been engaged in, um, in litigation in the federal court against the government of Canada ever since. And the government of Canada's position has been, all we need to do is obtain the diplomatic assurances from the foreign state. We don't need to monitor them or see if they have any effect. We just have to get them. Which is an entirely, you know, paper, paper exercise. So, yeah, that's. I think again, as as I said in my remarks, extradition is a scary, scary thing, and I think people are not frightened enough of it. And we were just reminded by a panelist that that's the Boily case. Exactly, that's the one. Uh, by an attendee. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Um, thank you so much for your responses. Um, I have a question here, uh, a follow up to your uh, answer, Rob, about the statistics of the, the number of uh, requests and the person's asking how many, uh, giving the little information on how many requests are refused or even made, um, how can you say that most go before the courts? Uh, I would say it's because crusading journalists over the years have managed to pry information out of the International Assistance Group. So we do have a sense uh, on a multi-year basis of how many requests are made, um, how many are refused. Uh, what we know, uh, the, evident, the evidence is, is completely conclusive that the, the government's objective is to extradite, if at all possible. Uh, that's that's a clear policy mandate. That's what international comity means in this setting, that we should extradite unless there is some really good reason not to. What we don't know is how many uh, cases are put forward for extradition by, by partners and IAG sort of turns in the back and says, we can't do that. But on the other hand, one another thing they do is work with our extradition partners to say, you need to fix up your request because it won't comply with our law, it won't get by our courts. And that again, in principle, is a good thing for our government to do, right? Because it does smooth out extradition relations and it helps to ensure that the actual bad guys are eventually uh, put in jail. But it's the ferocity with which they do it and the, the casual nature in which the civil rights of, of not just Canadians, but people in Canada are treated that, that I think is the concern. Thank you. Next question. Uh, how can we raise the issue of how the system of laws in another country has an entirely different standard for finding guilt, i.e. not beyond a reasonable doubt, but as in France, or specifically the anti-terrorism courts, uh, or something like a basket of possibilities? So I, I might just add that um, the treatment um, that the individual being extradited will face is addressed um, as a matter of discretion by the Minister of Justice, as I mentioned in my um, uh, presentation. Now, it, it's a legal question. Um, will they get a fair trial? Are the procedures uh, consistent with international human rights uh, due process standards? Um, uh, what about the sentencing process? What about the prison conditions? Um, you know, um, all of those uh, elements are supposed to inform the minister's surrender decision. Um, now, these are questions that are legal questions and they are routinely assessed in other domains of Canadian law. And one only need to point to the immigration procedures to know that these are the very same questions um, that the Immigration and Refugee Board grapple with day in and day out um, by decision makers uh, who are trained to assess the record 
uh, of the um, uh, the state that that the host country uh, that would be receiving uh, the deportee. Um, you know, we don't see evidence of careful assessment at the surrender stage um, uh, in the extradition contest, but that doesn't mean that these questions couldn't be properly assessed, um, judiciously assessed, in fact. Um, these are decisions that um, uh, we make in, in the Canadian decision-making context all the time outside of extradition, guided by legal norms. Um, so I, I just wanted to emphasize that these things can be considered, but in the bifurcated way that extradition proceeds in Canada, um, there isn't a coherent way to assess them now. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll ask those next two questions at the same time because I think they could probably be answered together. So the first one is, in the case of Hassan Diab, did Judge Maranger have discretion to determine that the handwriting evidence was manifestly unreliable? And then the second one is, is extradition for prosecution or for further investigation and search for more evidence? Who would like to answer? I'm happy to dig in on that one. Um, I think that Justice Moranger could definitely have concluded that the evidence was manifestly unreliable because it was demonstrated to be factually unreliable by numerous experts that the defense uh, put to the court. But the problem Justice Moranger had, I think even if he was inclined to make that finding, is that any, any discretion about whether evidence is unreliable enough to say that evidence has to be excluded is more illusory than real. Uh, a few years ago, I, I directed a research study of a large number of over 100 extradition cases in which this question came up. And the answer was always, if they're actually missing evidence, like if there's evidence of one of the elements is not there, then we say, okay, well, then that, that's a problem. Otherwise, the courts never, virtually never find evidence to be manifestly unreliable. So I think Justice Moranger was in a tough spot because his hands were tied by the way the law uh, had been phrased. but to, And to be clear, the law was phrased the way it was because that is the interpretation of the Extradition Act that the Crown has urged on the courts successfully. It does not have to be that way, but at this point it's going to require changing the act. And that's why we're, we're calling for parliamentary uh, scrutiny. And I'm sorry, Anne, what was the second question? Uh, is extradition for prosecution or for further investigation and a search for more evidence? We have a yeah. few, you know, a connoisseur of Sandiev's case in the audience. Of course, yeah. Um, and, you know, the Ontario Court of Appeal spoke to this in, in Dr. Diab's case. Um, other, uh, other states that are not common law states have a different kind of criminal law process than ours. It, it, you know, it's referred to as a, uh, an inquisitory kind of system. So... On the one hand, it is, it's anticipated that investigation will continue even after they have the person in custody. And the Supreme Court of Canada has said for a long time, you know, we have to make extradition work. We know that these criminal law systems don't match ours. That's not necessarily a bad thing. The problem in Dr. Diab's case was that France was manifestly unready to go to trial, which is why he sat in prison for three years as they tried and tried to find enough evidence to even prosecute him, and the case just kept collapsing. So that is certainly a point that needs to be addressed. Uh, with, even with our civil law extradition partner states, uh, they need to be some, approaching something close to trial readiness in order for extradition to be, to be justified. And you know maybe Dr. Diab's case was slightly unusual, but unusual cases often highlight just how bad the law is. If I can add, that's also a human rights issue because you know you, you're part of the human right to due process in regard specifically to a criminal charge is uh, is to have a, a, a trial which is uh, not only independent uh, uh, before an independent tribunal and so forth, but also a speedy trial, uh, not, not speedy in the sense of uh, of uh, uh, summary uh, trial, but but uh, with a, a degree of expeditiousness and not, not to be hanging about. So again, if if Canada is going to be compromising our own duties of assurance 
uh, then I think again the standard needs to be a high standard, one that's scrupulously respected, not 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 uh, tenuous or uncertain or you know, and having the kind of outcome of languishing. That's complete. That is, in my view, a breach, another breach of human rights. Thank you. Sherry, did you want to say something? I'm going to answer the next question. Uh, <laughs> you're too fast. So the, I'm just going to read it for you. What sort of response, if any, has the government made to the Alifax proposal? Indeed. And that's a, a very important question. And I, I'm sure my co-panelists will, uh, will want to chime in as well. But I'll say this. Um, a group of us um, assembled in the fall and uh, really identified the need to have extradition reform included in the mandate letter for the current Minister of Justice. Um, we tried um, through a number of formal and informal levers. Um, we also held um, a, a media conference, a press brief briefing in the fall ahead of those mandate letters, um, but you'll not see any <laughs> reference to extradition reform in the Justice Minister's mandate letter. Now, the fact that it's not in the mandate letter doesn't mean that it can't be taken up by the current government. And we are working on this as we speak. A number of us have had informal meetings with various parliamentarians as, as well as uh, members of the official opposition um, in an effort um, to move this forward and, and actually to get extradition reform on the agenda. We have not yet been successful though, um, and thus in the importance of webinars like this, because it's really, I think, in our estimation, critical that ordinary folks, not law professors, um, push their own MPs on these questions. Um, and Rob, I think in particular, you might wanna speak to the efforts you've made um, you know, in the immediate wake of the Halifax Colloquium um, until now. Sure, yeah, I mean, I think you've summed it up uh, pretty well, Sherry. There've been various conversations uh, with, with various political actors across the, the governmental spectrum. Uh, a lot of awareness raising, a lot of informal conversations. Um, I, I guess you would say we have formally sent the Halifax proposals uh, to, the, to the government. They were sent to the prime minister and to the justice minister directly. There has been no formal response uh, to them yet. So we, we continue our efforts. We are redoubling our efforts to get this on the legislative agenda somehow. Um, I, I don't normally show up and be really sympathetic to the government, but while we live in complicated times and they do have a lot on their plates uh, for sure, but this is a pressing uh, reform issue that has been hanging for a long time and, and really does need to be addressed. So uh, can I say they will run out of energy before we do? If I can add add a line to this in terms of uh, uh, these the difficult times that we are living in, and and I can uh, appreciate that our government has uh, many constraints on it, and we cannot actually impact a lot of things. We can impact our own laws, and uh, for our government, which purports to be a leader in the field of human rights and uh, rule of law and dem democratic governance and so forth, we could have exemplary laws. We could be actually indicating model uh, approaches uh, for, for uh, this kind of a, a situation. So I really don't, uh, uh, I don't think that there's a legitimate excuse to say the world's a messy place. Precisely because the world's a messy place and it's difficult to affect some things, we should be absolutely making sure our own house is in order and actually leading in this regard. Definitely, thank you. I just got one last question uh, in the Q&A box. I think we're gonna end with this one uh, unless you have last comments after that because we're fast approaching 1.30 uh, here in, on unceded Algonquin territory. So the question is if or when France seeks an extradition of Dr. Diab for trial in 2023 or after trying him in abstention and find, finding him guilty on what the reason for trial show are internally inconsistent and not based on what exculpatory evidence was accepted by the, their own uh, lower specials court, how would the application of our current extradition act unfold? Well, France uh, could very well make an extradition request either to have him at the trial or to uh, put him in prison after a trial in absentia at which he was convicted. Um, and 
that's that's the the sort of Damocles that's currently hanging over Dr. Diab's head, as well as his family and and all of us who who support him. We're hopeful. I think I'm hopeful that that situation, you know, the, the possibility of France making a request takes into consideration the fact that our prime minister publicly said, well, this can never happen again. But the prime minister said that publicly, um, you know, with expressing some desire to maybe change the law, which dissipated completely, but um, very, very fierce argument to be made that France uh, should be deprived of any jurisdiction it might have over Dr. Diab based on how abusive and persecutory its, uh, its conduct has been so far, um, in, in my view, they've breached the extradition treaty. In fact, I mean, my view will never be will never be litigated because the government of Canada won't take me up on on making that point to France. Uh, in my view, France has breached the international covenant on civil and political rights in several ways through this matter. Uh, I know John and Sherry agree with me. We were uh, and and you, your organization, and so many were were urging Canada to suspend. The, the extradition treaty with France for exactly these reasons. France is a terrible extradition partner. We know this is not the only case, by the way, that, that, that France has been problematic on. So I can only see fierce, fierce resistance and hopefully saner heads would prevail in the government of Canada and some kind of informal intervention would be made behind the scenes where some sober adult says to another in Canada, says to a sober adult in France, look, you better not make that request. We can hope that, but who knows? Thank you. Any last comments from our panelists? Thank you so much, everyone, for your very great questions and for the to the panelists for their answers. Do you have any last comments, uh, parting comments before we end the webinar? All right. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming. I'm putting the links in the chat again to the Halifax proposals, to our video that we saw today, to the action you can take to urge the Canadian government to reform the law. Also an action uh, for justice for Hassan Diab, as well as the um, uh, Hassan Diab support committee website for more uh, news and ways that you can support. So. Again, thank you so much to all the attendees. Thank you to our amazing panelists and um, take care everyone and we'll see you at the next event.